You're listening to a Frequency Podcast Network production in association with City News. If you don't live there and you know one thing about Thunder Bay, Ontario, chances are it's this. Systemic racism exists in Thunder Bay Police Service at an institutional level. Because of discrimination and a lack of training, officers didn't take basic investigative steps, even ignored evidence. At least nine cases were so problematic they should be reinvestigated. The story you'll hear today about Thunder Bay isn't necessarily new, but it isn't old either. This is one of those cases where a systemic problem is identified, reports are written, recommendations made, and... Nothing changes. This is a frustrating story to cover for reporters, but it is more than that. If you're Indigenous and have any connections to this city, it is heartbreaking. It happens again and again and again, and that's not an exaggeration. Just this month, after years of this, two new reports detail more careless, incompetent police work, more deaths that need to be reinvestigated, More missing Indigenous women and girls. Nothing has changed. How long can this go on? I'm Jordan Heath-Rawlings. This is The Big Story. Willow Fiddler is a national news reporter. For The Globe and Mail, she covers northern Ontario, including Thunder Bay. Hi, Willow. Hi, how are you? I'm all right. How are you doing? I'm okay, thanks. Can you first maybe tell us about the most recent public report. We're going to talk about a bunch of reports today, I guess, but the most recent public report that has led to the newest controversy in Thunder Bay. Right. And it is a bit confusing uh, with the number of reports and uh, investigations yeah. and everything that's happening. So uh, you'll have to pardon me if uh, if I get things confused, but I'll do my best. So the latest public report is the final report from what is called the Executive Governance Committee. And they reported back to the Office of the Independent Police Review Director on four recommendations that came from uh, what was called the Broken Trust Report. And, and that report was done by the OIPRD back in 2018. And what that report revealed was uh, systemic racism, uh, you know, ingrained in the Thunder Bay Police Service. Um, mm-hmm kind of at all levels. And 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 one of the major findings, uh, recommendations uh, from that report was that nine death investigations of uh, nine Indigenous people uh, be reinvestigated because they were uh, so poorly done and negligent. Um, that was one of the major recommendations from the Broken Trust Report. So since then, um, there's been, uh, you know, the work has been done, the investigative work. There was an investigative team put together that was uh, led by a retired OPP superintendent uh, named Ken Leppert. And he worked with uh, investigators from the Thunder Bay Police Service as well as other uh, services uh, in the province. So they did the nine reinvestigations. And so they finally just released their findings from that report. Uh, sorry, from that, from that, from those reinvestigations right. and reported back to the OIPRD on that. So again, what, and, and so there's a couple of things in there um, because that wasn't the only recommendation from the broken trust report. There was like 44 recommendations total, but the nine uh, the recommendation to reinvestigate the nine cases was was a big one. The other part of that was that uh, investigators um, had to identify any additional sudden deaths uh, within the Thunder Bay Police Service that they felt should be looked at again or that needed kind of further action. Um, and they came back with 16 more cases um, so that was also in the public report uh, back to the OIPRD. So that, that was kind of an astonishing number, but not really surprising uh, for everybody, given given the findings from the Broken Trust report in 2018 that just saw how problematic and negligent the police work has been for particularly for Indigenous people in the city. Can you just quickly tell me uh, what the OIPRD is? Yeah, so the uh, it's the Office of the Independent Police Review Director, and they're the uh, like Ontario's oversight agency for um, 
policing. Uh, they handle like public complaints uh, for for policing. You know, they hold like hearings and stuff like that for misconduct. They started the broken trust report because of a, a complaint they received from the family of a man named Stacy DeBungi. He was a, a 40, 40 something year old man who was found uh, dead in, in one of the city rivers back in 2015. The family filed a complaint um, about how police treated his death. They, you know, they said that they uh, ruled out foul play almost immediately. They kind of brushed it off as just another drunk Indian that rolled into the river. So they they took their complaint to the OIPRD, and it was actually that complaint that that spurred the broken trust report and said, okay, we need to really take a, a good look at what's what happened, what's happening here with Indigenous people uh, dying in the city. Yeah, and and I know the reports uh, kind of overlap on top of each other and can be confusing. So maybe let's talk just a little bit about about the kinds of stuff. That's in these reports. I mean, these deaths, what kinds of sudden deaths are we talking about here? And and when we talk about them not being investigated fully or or really taken care of by the police, what does that mean? Can you give us some examples? For sure. So I think the um in in the nine reinvestigations, um, you know, and this goes back years and years. Right. Um, this is nothing new. So the nine reinvestigations, four of those cases, uh, deaths, were um, First Nations youth, students who uh, were from the north and in, in northwestern Ontario, remote uh, fly-in communities who left their homes and families to attend high school here in Thunder Bay because there's no high schools back uh up north in the reserves Mm -hmm. where you can um, graduate. So uh, a lot of times the students have to leave homes and they come to places like Thunder Bay um, to go to high school. So between 2000 and 2011, there was a number of deaths of Indigenous people. And and during that time, you know, uh, like in the early 2000s, people were noticing Indigenous communities around here were noticing that. And in 2015, they had a, a, a coroner's inquest here in Thunder Bay that was called, uh, it's referred to as, well, a couple of names, but it, the student inquest or the seven student inquest. Um, and that looked at the deaths of seven First Nation students who had come from the north to Thunder Bay to attend high school, ended up dying um, between 2000 and 2011. Mm-hmm. Five of those seven students were found in city rivers. Um, which really sounded the alarm bells around here um, and had so many people worried, had the entire community. Well, I shouldn't say the entire community because there was a lot of people who weren't concerned about it. And that was kind of the problem. Mm. So uh, the the coroner's inquest looked at those seven deaths. Um, four of them, as I mentioned, um, were flagged in the broken trust report that should have been reinvestigated. The coroner's inquest, the jury came back, I think, and 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 found maybe changes in in three of the seven deaths in in terms of the cause of manner and cause of death and how they you know how they died. But it it offered very very little and to 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 no uh, closure or answers for the families of these students. They were still left after this inquest with a lot of questions and. Uh, you know, n- no further clarity on on what happened uh, to their loved one. So I mentioned that the five, like five of the seven were found in city rivers. All of them, all of the seven students, you know, um, had been uh, drinking. So there was levels of, you know, intoxication. And that was major because in the broken trust report, um, it, it found that, you know, police, police biases were such that, and are such that, Indigenous deaths are easily dismissed by them if there's, you know, evidence of intoxication, for example. So that was extremely problematic. Just simple things, too, because, you know, a lot of these cases, for example, started out as missing persons reports where, you know, days and weeks even went by without, but before police even started searching any kind of search. Um, 
that's come up again in in this new in the in the latest report that um, plagues the 60 new cases that it calls for a coroner's inquest or review on missing persons. There was a case, you know, missing persons where, um, yeah, police don't don't search for like it was actually 31 days in in this one woman's case before police actually started searching. She was an wow. indigenous woman with uh, who had been in hospital with mental health, um, issues and, you know, 31 days to, to search for a missing person is just, you know, beyond yeah any sort of common sense. Right. So it's a, a lot of those kind of cases in terms of police neglect and, and, um, you know, a lot of that was found to, you know, be because of things like bias and racism and all of that. So that is a public report and I'm just going to kind of lay it out here to, to clarify it. Um, that's a public report that wanted 16 old deaths reinvestigated because the investigations may not have been done properly. But there is also, and I promise this is the last report I'm going to ask you about before we talk about the systemic stuff. <laughs> there is also a private report mm -hmm. that we know a little bit about what's inside. And that deals with, uh, I'm glad you mentioned uh, missing Indigenous women a minute ago, because that deals with this. And what does that report say? Yeah, so I'll just clarify. So the public report um, has the information of the 16 additional cases, but it doesn't have any of the details on those individual cases themselves. Right. Those details are in this second confidential report that's not really so confidential <laughs> anymore. But I see. Um, so that that report outlines, uh, kind of provides case summaries of, of the 16 cases what investigators found, um, you know, reasons for uh, further investigation. And then it, and then, yes, it also flags 25 uh, unsolved cases of missing and murdered Indigenous women that, uh, that have been with the Thunder Bay police for uh, quite some time. Uh, one of the, and, and this is a list uh, that was submitted by the service to the national inquiry back in 2017 when they were having uh, the national hearings on that. So that's kind of the official list that, that that would have been put together. And that includes, you know, old cases. I think one of the most well-known ones around here is um, Sandra Johnson, who, you know, was found killed uh, naked face down in, in the snow. Um, Mm. Again, in a, in, a, in a city waterway. I mean, it was winter, so uh, you know the water was frozen. Back in, like, it's been over 25 years for that. Um, and her sister still lives here in the city and does, you know, so much advocacy work to, you know, bring attention to these these issues. And I, um, her sister's name's Sharon, and and I just I have so much admiration and and respect for that woman because to to think of the things that she must have had to endure during her you know during her quest for justice for her sister, I just I can't imagine. Well, I did want to ask you about the prevailing feeling around Thunder Bay right now because as you've kind of detailed, there are reports of this systemic racism going back years, decades, and now there are two new ones. Uh, this is clearly still happening. How did the public react? And is anybody surprised? No one is surprised. Um, it's so frustrating. <laughs> like, you know, I, I laugh out of sheer frustration yeah. as someone who's been covering this for, for uh, six years now. Now we're faced with, uh, you know, I just uh, came from a Thunder Bay Police Service board press conference, um, kind of where they've, you know, again, stated, you know, they're committed to these issues and, and all of this, acknowledging that, you know, there's, there's little trust. Um, but that's kind of about it. You know, there, there's, there's really no action beyond those words. And that's frustrating as well. How does this police service still exist in this current form? I mean, you would have thought one of the past two, three, four reports of this stuff would have at least, if not, you know, a disbanding of the force, but at least some systematic reform. Yeah. Well, I mean, I think the, the city has a lot to do with that. Uh, the city council kind of, you know, has, has been able to 
keep themselves separated from this and and how you know um we we reached out recently to some of the city councillors and and many of them are, are don't want to speak on the issue i mean they they some of them don't even know what's happening to be honest and and have no idea you know what the latest is or what's going on uh and that's really indicative of of how the board manages you know to to stay within you know uh their bubble as as so many people i uh you know i've talked to say you know they're kind of they operate within this bubble um and and where there's little accountability and and you know little transparency um despite these reports like you say you know like the board had this very you know the the report um, by Senator former Senator uh, Murray Sinclair, um, and at the time this was at the same time as the OIPRD broken trust report. You know, and and there was promises back then of of you know there was the new police chief who was the first female police chief for the service. Uh, you know, veteran, twenty five years with the service, and then the board picked their first Indigenous chair to 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 lead the board, and she was a. Uh, a woman as well. So, you know, there was kind of like those kind of moves, but she didn't last. And she had said, you know, there was a very clear roadmap with Sinclair's report on, on what the board could do. And yet, yeah, there's been very little movement on that. Now the, the board is now uh, <laughs> coming up with another report. Um, so they've now <laughs> hired or established a, an expert panel of individuals they call you know experts in policing and community governance and and all that so this this panel is is well going to assist them in uh, a number of things i guess implementing past recommendations reviewing those um and then coming up with more recommendations on <laughs> what they need to do one more report is going to do this right it just takes one more report yeah yeah just one more um uh, let's bring in some more experts to to get this done um so this is led by former toronto police board chair uh alok mccurgy um and then there there's uh, several others on there as well i i've spoken to mr mccurgy about you know what he thought about the board and, and reports and everything and, and his feeling was that there wasn't uh enough time given to implement the recommendations from the sinclair report and um you know i think the the other part of that is just this whole accountability again thing like the service and the board are just kind of accountable to themselves it seems right mm. i mean they they self report on the recommendations in these reports so you know for example like the the police chief tells the OIPRD that they've completed 80% of the recommendations from the broken trust report and yet there's nothing in place to check the accuracy of that, right? So, I mean, the whole question right. of uh, an, an issue of oversight too, um, both at a municipal level and provincially is, is is a big one. I don't know if you would know the answer to this, um, but I'm curious about what anyone in the police service on the front lines out there uh, doing the work or not doing the work has to say about um, these pretty damning reports that keep coming. Well, yeah, and this is kind of where it gets interesting. So, I mean, the police association, I mean, has not really ever accepted the findings from the broken trust report. And I think the challenge in that has been understanding what systemic racism is. They took it quite personally and felt that it was attack on them as being racist officers. And that's not really what broken trust was or said, um, you know, systemic racism is such a complicated, can be a complicated uh, thing to understand. Right. Um, so that's been a little bit difficult, but at the same time, the police association has also, you know, said that they have zero confidence in in their police chief too. They've, you know, flagged a number of, of internal issues. The board and the chief, you know, um, have been named in several human rights complaints by officers, um, which I'm told is uh, kind of unheard of, um, including a board member. So, you know what, like all around, there's just very little uh, confidence and trust in the leadership of the service and board. And it's just really, it's, it's kind of, it continues for some reason to blow all of our minds who are watching this and working on this and paying attention, how does this continue? You know, and again, we were asking that of the board chair this morning in the, in the press conference. Um, 
you know, they they seem quite confident, though, that that they're just going to continue on. And um, yeah, hopefully this expert panel does it, <laughs> does it for them, but unlikely. I can hear I can hear in your voice how frustrating it is. And, and it doesn't seem like there's anything concrete on the horizon. But I mean, maybe just imagine a more optimistic world. What do local Indigenous leaders have to say about this? What would they like to see happen to create meaningful change? Well, at this point, they're calling for the Thunder Bay Police Service to be dismantled. Uh, Not just them, but I mean, we have the lawyers of the families who've been involved in these death investigations calling for, you know, the, the service to be dismantled. I mean, when there's no more trust and confidence left in in an entire community. I mean, people really don't see any other option except for that. Um, But I don't know if that's going to happen. I mean, people, you know, Thunder Bay is a larger municipality and it's the last one now in Northwestern Ontario, um, the last municipal uh, police service. Other police services in the province have been dismantled and taken over by the OPP, but most times it's because of uh, costs, right? It's just, it's become too costly for, for that municipality. But it makes me think of, um, you know, the case in, uh, there was a, the Kenora Police Service was disbanded, taken over by the OPP back in the earlier uh, 2000s. And that followed kind of similar similar uh, events surrounding the treatment of Indigenous people, but but it was also cost-related too. Um, and the city was quite, uh, I think, happy to give give it up to the OPP. Whereas in Thunder Bay's case, there's, uh, I, don't, I don't see that ever happening, not with the current uh, leadership anyways. Um, but simil- similarities with Kenora in terms of, of how they were investigating deaths of Indigenous people. There was one case in particular of a man named Max Kakagamic who was found beaten uh, beaten to death on the on the streets of Kenora. And the investigating officers basically botched the investigation and pinned it on an innocent guy. I, I'm not sure why to save, uh, you know, the, the actual suspect, but uh, who is related to another officer, apparently. But uh, and and just a lot of outcry from Indigenous leadership and communities uh, in that area at the time um, that uh, that they needed to go. Yeah. So for you know the Indigenous community and leaders, it's it's it, they very much see it as time for yeah the service to go and bring someone in who's uh, you know maybe not going to be a whole lot better. But what from what I hear, it's you know the OPP will provide a little bit more. Um, transparency and accountability to the community. Last question, and and usually I ask, uh, what comes next? You know, what's the next major step uh, in one of these things? Um, what is next? I guess what I'm hearing from you is is not much. <laughs> more more waiting on reports and investigations. So I mean, there's, uh, yeah, I don't think we mentioned like I mean the so the on. Ontario Civilian Police Commission, which is the OCPC, um, which is kind of the oversight agency for boards and services, they and that that's who hired uh, Sinclair, Senator Sinclair, to do his report in 2018. Anyways, they they are now again doing another investigation into the service and the leadership. The chief, well, actually, no, and the OPP is also criminally investigating members of the service at this time, even though they haven't said which members, but um, based on the number of human rights complaints and the the claims and allegations in there against the police chief, it, it, it's kind of, we, we can see where that's headed. So, you know, we, yeah, it's kind of at this point waiting for uh, the powers to uh, be to complete their work and investigations and again, wait for more reports and and recommendations. Um, You know, in the meantime, I think it's important to just continue to to keep this story uh, alive and, you know, people aware of what's happening because I, I, it's, I, it's, it's not, I mean, it's not funny, but it's kind of people's reactions I get to this story from outside of Thunder Bay and around, like it just kind of blows everybody's minds. And it's like, how does this happen? How does this continue? Like, you don't know how many times I've heard that from people over the years. And uh, that's literally why we reached out to you, because that was our reaction. 
And, you know, uh, yeah, I join, <laughs> I'm asking that as well. Like, but like I said, like, we just, we have to keep that because the, the risk is, you know, that, that this will get swept under the rug, you know, we'll kind of forget about it. You know, it'll, it'll go away eventually. And um, there's just, there's actual lives at risk here and at stake. And, and those, um, yeah, that hasn't been addressed yet. Willow, thank you so much for taking the time to walk us through this. Thanks for having me. Willow Fiddler reporting out of Thunder Bay for The Globe and Mail. That was The Big Story. For more from us, head to thebigstorypodcast.ca, find us on Twitter at thebigstoryfpn, and write to us via email, thebigstorypodcast, all one word, at rci.rogers.com. You guys have responded with so many ideas for stories we are having, I'm not kidding you, we are having a special listener-only story session next week to figure out which ones we'll cover. But we'll try to give you credit for the ideas when we do. You can find The Big Story in any podcast player. And of course, you can ask for it on any smart speaker. Just say, play The Big Story podcast, but don't mix up Alexa and Google. They don't like it. Thanks for listening. I'm Jordan Heath-Rawlings. We'll talk tomorrow.